Welcome to Talking Jazz. My guest today is composer, educator, saxophonist Greg Yasinitsky, and he's talking with me from Washington State University. We're going to talk about some of Greg's music, but also just life as being an educator and composer and balancing all these things. Welcome, Greg. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be part of this. I'm happy to have you. We have some really cool selections from your two releases with your big band to some degree small or larger group we're going to talk about each one of them and how they came about and a little bit about the music so the first one we're going to head to is a tune called serpentine which you recorded on your 2018 yas band but before we dive into that song you know maybe just give us a quick synopsis of your background what got you into music and doing all that i'm an old guy now so hopefully this won't take too long. I was born in San Francisco and I grew up in the suburbs in San Francisco. I was always very interested in music from a very early age. My grandmother was operatically trained singer. She was a fantastic musician. She gave me some of my first piano lessons. My grandfather was very interested in music. He actually used to write for the Russian language newspaper in San Francisco and he would review this the San Francisco symphony concerts. As I got older and I was in college, he had me go to the concerts and take notes and then give them to him and then he would put them in his article. I was lucky to be part of a very good music program in the schools, especially the high school jazz band was really terrific. I played in there, I became very interested in jazz. I knew I wanted to play saxophone right away. They tried to convince me to play clarinet. My mother wanted me to play trumpet, they held my breath to play the saxophone. So that was it. I mean, you know, I loved it. And I started trying to write for the jazz band in high school. All the stuff was pretty awful, but I became interested in being a composer too. I went to college mostly in San Francisco. I went to community college first, College of San Mateo, and then I went to San Francisco State. There wasn't that much jazz at San Francisco State. There's a great saxophone player, Bennett Friedman, who ran the big band there. And I played in the big band. There was like an extra thing and it didn't count for anything else. So I studied classical music. I studied classical composition and saxophone. By the time I was working on my master's degree at San Francisco State, I was being asked to play extra in the San Francisco Symphony. And then I was uh, playing a lot of shows, nightclub stuff around town and all that. But I was really interested in being in education. They hired me to teach at San Francisco State. They hired me in San Jose State. I taught community college there. And then there were all these budget cuts in the state. And I thought I need a permanent job. I applied for jobs all over the country. And I was very lucky to get the one at Washington State University. And I've been there ever since. I taught saxophone there for many, many years. I'm teaching composition now. I'm coordinator of jazz studies there. I served seven years as the director of the School of Music. After I was at WSU for a while, I decided I wanted to go back to school and learn some more. I went to the Eastman School and got a doctorate in classical composition. So it's funny. I mean, all my degrees are in classical composition. I have no degrees in saxophone. I have no degrees in jazz studies. So I'm basically unqualified for the job I've held for the last 40 years. And Washington State University is a great place to be. I've worked with a lot of fantastic students. We have a great faculty, great program, and I get to collaborate a lot. And I'm lucky enough to get to travel a lot to do things. I travel around the country, sometimes go to Europe, to Canada a lot. I've been to Asia. I've been very lucky. I've had a wonderful career. I have a lot of music published, a lot for school ensembles, as well as professional groups. I play with a number of different jazz groups, and I'm invited around to play at different colleges and so forth. And I play saxophone in the, in the Spokane Symphony. So I play for their pops concerts, but also the classical saxophone solos that are in standard rep pieces. So I've been doing all that for a long time. It's great. This is my last year at Washington State University. I'm going to retire in May. I guess that's what I can tell you. I know. That's hard to like put a lifetime synopsis out there really quick. <laughs> But, you know, you're obviously qualified for what you're doing. And, and I would love to hear before we listen to the Serpentine, maybe give us a few tidbits here what to, what to listen for, what we can expect when, when we put this on. Well, I wrote this. Uh, oftentimes I get in invited to either write for publication or school bands or these other bands request. I had what I thought at the time was this pretty special student big band. And I thought I'm going to write something especially for them. And then I thought I wanted to make it kind of modern and hopefully kind of hip 
but I'm so old that what that meant was 1970s kind of pedal point, you know, modal jazz with these kind of shifting pentatonic lines. So that's what's happening in here. There's these big, you know, kind of open fifths in this pentatonic line that goes in and out of the chord. You know, I hope a big, exciting kind of piece. This is my own band. I should say something about that. You know, I've written for student groups for so long. I started to think, I wonder what it'd be like if I had a bunch of my friends, you know, really great professionals to record this stuff. Would, would it be different? And it is, of course. And so I was grateful to do that. I mean, it's kind of funny in a way because there's a certain amount of overdubbing to make the band happen. Mm -hmm. So there were two trumpet players and then they overdubbed the other two parts. And I'm trying to remember now, I think I'm playing lead alto on this and I'm playing tenor saxophone. And then my nephew who teaches at Long Beach City College, he's director of jazz studies there. He's playing on the record. So, you know, it's mixed up Dave Glenn, who used to play with Thad and Mel in New York, played with Jerry Mulligan. He's on the record. He lives in Walla Walla. Not that close to me, but close. Everything that's four hours away in Washington is considered close, you know. Great players, and it was fun to do this project. I hope everybody likes it, but that's what it is. It's that kind of modal. We'll talk about the band a little more after we listen to that, but let's put on this one first. So this is Serpentine. This is from Greg Yasinitsky's 2018 release, Yats Band. Y-A-Z-Z. -Z. Here we go. Enjoy. <laughs>
again a selection from the Yas Band, a 2018 release from my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky, who you also heard on the saxophone soloing, and of course it's his compositions. You know, I wanted to explore that a little more. You talked earlier about having to overdub some part. So a usual big band would have five saxes and five trumpets and five trombones or something like that, maybe some extras in the rhythm section, but you only have three saxes, I think, and two trumpets and three trombones. How did you have to work this to get the big band sound? How does that work? So I have the two records and one of them is a full big band, but it was produced by having people overdubbing their parts. We're somewhat isolated. There are a number of good players here, but I either had to bring in enough from outside the area. I wanted to see as an experiment too, if I brought in just some of the folks and then we could overdub the parts and then we could have everything be complete. So that's the way that we did that first record. I'm happy with how it came out. There's a lot of great players on it. They add a lot of wonderful things to the record. I'm happy about that. The second one was actually meant to be kind of a retirement project almost. And it was a sabbatical project also. The idea was, what if I put a, like a little big band together and we could play around the area and stuff and I'd have this group to write for and it would be fun. For this one, I really wanted to record everything in the studio with everybody. So it's a 10 piece band and we put everybody in the studio, but then COVID hit. And the day they closed, basically closed the university down and a lot of stuff throughout the region was the day before the scheduled second recording session to finish everything up. So about half the record is recorded with everybody on tracks, right? But the second one, and I called people up and I said, how do you guys feel about this? Do you want to come to the studio? And then there was like, we better be safe. We postponed everything. And I thought, okay, this will blow over in a little while and I'll get everybody back in the studio. A month goes by, two months go by. There are now more restrictions in the studio. Only one person can be there in there at a time and, all, and masks and all this stuff. Understandably, and I thought, okay, so how am I going to finish this? How am I going to do it? And I thought, all right, I'm just going to get people to play their parts at home and mm -hmm. send me the recordings and I'll assemble it that way. Not quite half, but almost half of the record is done that way. And on those tracks, I played all the saxophone parts and the lead trumpet player lives in Ellensburg, Washington, which is four and a half hours away or something. So he sent me the tracks online. And then I started thinking, you know, if really people aren't going to be here, maybe I should invite some people from elsewhere to play. I have a friend who's a wonderful pianist in Italy who teaches at Bologna Conservatory of Music and he taught in Ferrara for many years at the Frescobaldi Conservatory. His name is Teo Chalvarella. I did a concert tour in Italy with him a few years ago and so, you know, I sent him an email and said, can you play a piano solo on this track? He did. And then I have another friend, you know probably that I wrote this jazz concerto, orchestra and piano and it involves sort of classical playing and jazz playing. And there's a wonderful pianist at the Louisiana State University who's been a friend for a long time, Willis Deloney, who was the soloist when I wrote that piece for him and so I contacted him and said do you want to play a piano solo on this so he sent a track from Louisiana and people sent video that did in their houses and for some of these I've made YouTube videos with every all of us in a little box playing you know but so my intention really was to make a recording with everybody in the room all at once just like a regular recording and like I said about half of it is done that way the rest of it had to be done in this kind of pandemic way so that's why it's called New Normal and I actually wrote a tune called New Normal that we recorded that way to include on the recording while you were describing that I actually changed the order, I thought, you know, after we heard that, it would be great to contrast with one of those tracks. I'm going to have us all listen to Song for Laura, which features Theo on the piano and, and you on, on Barry's saxophone. And, and just to listen for is how does this work when we put all the parts together in terms of feelings, inflections, you know, and it's really hard. I don't think, you know, we can do this by ear or detect any difference. The technology has gotten so advanced when you listen to it on the headphones you really can play with that and we saw so many examples you know over the last year how that can be done to the highest level and it's kind of cool yeah i mean it is really challenging it's hard you're not playing with the same people and even if they send you the recording and then you try and match what the lead player is playing and all that it's just tough my goal with the record and i hope i succeeded of course not every track sounds exactly the same as the other one but i think if i play the tracks for people and say which one 
one do you think was done mm -hmm. in the studio and which one do you think was done that way? They usually can't tell mm -hmm. unless I tell them. I can say this was a piece that I wrote for my daughter quite a while ago when she was basically when she was an infant. And it's nice because when she was a kid in school, one of the assignments they had her do, I don't know, in the first, second grade or something, is to bring a song in that represents you. And of course, people brought in their favorite pop song. I was so touched that Laura picked this record actually it's a small group version of this she took that to school and said this song is me and I thought that was so wonderful and then I played this song at her wedding too and I thought well when I do this record I have to put it on here and make a little big band version of it make an arrangement of it actually I'm playing all the saxophones on here the solo one the solo part really is tenor saxophone though that is a really cool story thanks for for letting us know all the details so I think we should listen to it now with that backdrop of how it was written for your daughter and those cool stories stories behind it. This is Song for Laura from the album New Normal Yas Band and it features Tio Chevarella and of course my guest Greg Yasinitsky on the saxophones. Here we go!
That was Song for Laura from the album New Normal, a brand new release by my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky. And you also heard Greg on the saxophones. We are listening to music from the two albums from his Yas band. We're going to go back to the one before one more time and, and listen to a song called New York Confidential. So obviously you're not in New York. What's your relation here to New York? Is it a story or what's what's the story yeah, behind? There is a story. You know, you can't help who you are. You just are what you are. I'm a born on the West Coast and grew up in the suburbs. And so I kind of a West Coast guy. I love New York. I've had a chance to go a number of different times, do some recording there, do some playing there and all that. You and I both served on the board for the Jazz Education Network. The organization before that, that was the big academic organization was the International Association for Jazz Education, right? And there was a conference in New York that I went to and Maria Schneider's band was playing. And I had known about Maria Schneider and followed her career and programmed her music with my school big band and all that stuff. But this was the first chance I had to see her band live. I mean, she's such a huge talent. It was so interesting, like a completely different way of thinking about how to use the big band, different harmonic ideas and all that. The band was great too. I mean, it just had all these unbelievable music musicians in it. And I thought, I'm inspired by this. I have to write something to kind of react to this. It's not that I was trying to write like Maria Schneider. I don't think anybody can do that. But I wanted to see if I could come up with something that was different, that had this New York sensibility about it. I tried to use some different kinds of harmonies and take a different approach, different approach to it. It was fun to do. I pro programmed it with my school band a number of times. And then uh, the pianist on this is Brian Ward, who was on our faculty at the time. He did a beautiful job with this and it's very demanding also for the band itself especially lead trumpet John Harbaugh played with Buddy Rich years ago he's the lead trumpet player on there and I think does a fantastic job it's all kind of tricky harmony hard to hear in some ways for the band and hard to tune it was just wonderful to collaborate with all of them and hear them play this it's a very powerful recording very very fun to listen to and I love the horn walls so to say <laughs> of sound walls of sound from the horn section so let's have a listen so this is a New York concert Confidential from the 2018 Yas Band release. It features Brian Ward and it's a Greg Yasinitsky composition who you'll also hear on the saxophones. Here we go.
That was New York Confidential, a selection from the 2018 Yas Band release by my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky, who is at Washington State University, professor of jazz studies, leading the jazz program, saxophonist, composer, extraordinaire. Something that we can hear here is that you like impressions and John Coltrane and the modal kind of jazz. So can I ask you a little bit about your influence? It's just my generation, I think. Yeah, I do like that stuff, of course. Everybody likes it. Every saxophone player, whether they play like Coltrane or they don't play like Coltrane, everybody has to sort of deal with Coltrane. You have to respond in some way. And then, you know, I like Joe Henderson a lot, you know, and he had written a lot of these kinds of modal tunes. I like McCoy Tyner's piano playing and all that stuff. But the deal with the one, two, three is that I was asked to do a presentation for the Honors College here at Washington State University. I've been asked enough number of times. And Monica, you're such a great composer. Maybe you've been asked also, I was asked to do a presentation on what I think about or how to compose. Where did that come from is the title sometimes that they use for these things. And so I thought, well, maybe I should write something that has a concept in it that I could explain that hopefully even general audience members could grasp that was not too overly technical. I came up with this idea that I would have this accompaniment that goes one, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. And so you hear that in the piano. And I thought, well, I'll tell him that that's behind the piece and I'll call it one, two, three. And then I thought, well, it's like a five minute lecture. Maybe I need to do some more. I started thinking about different ways to incorporate one, two, three in a piece. I won't get into all of it because it's all over the place. It's just everywhere. It's a 24 bar form. It's kind of a modified blues. The first mm -hmm. phrase is three, eight bar phrases. The first phrase has one chord. The second phrase has two chords. The third phrase has three chords. Chords. The motion between the first chord and the second chord is a third, and then it goes up, and then it goes back a third. The chord progression at the end goes three, two, one. There's a bunch of this stuff. Brass play, and they play one note. Then later, they play two notes. And then later, they play three notes. The way it's scored is that for the first four bars, it's in unison, and then the next four bars, it's in two parts, and then the next four bars, it's in three parts. And then it reverses that. I mean, I could bore you to death by talking about this. You know, how many sections of ensemble chorus are there? Two of them are soft and one is loud and one's in unison and two are harmonized. It goes on and on with this kind of stuff. But that was the idea behind it. And I think what's interesting is that I've, I've been able to play it with some really good musicians. Nobody ever notices any of that until I bring it up. And I think that's probably a good thing. You know, as a composer, it's tough to balance the intellectual and the intuitive. How much do you just do, you know, like just imagine the music and write it out? How much do you kind of think through? The great composers have a balance of, of the two. So I was aspiring for that. But I think the plan is not what's important. It's the music that's important. So oftentimes I have a plan for the piece and then I forget what the plan is as soon as it's done because... If it sounds good, then that's good. If it doesn't, then maybe I need to scrap the piece. So the plan's not really that important. It's just a vehicle to get where the music is. And this one has a lot more planning in it than a lot of pieces. While I'm a jazz composer, sometimes I think as a jazz composer, you're supposed to improvise the composition almost. Just imagine it and write it down without planning too much. But sometimes I, there's a lot of planning. So it just depends. How fun. And, and I was going to comment exactly on that saying, you know, after all this planning, the cool thing is is that you don't hear anything of this planning. And that's the mastery, you know, of the art. If there's concepts behind you and thinking, but the music speaks for itself. This piece definitely does. <laughs> Another one very powerful and, and really represents what you can do when you have, you know, the amounts of horns and, and the things you can play with to create different textures and different sounds. Wonderful piece. And we did not hear the one, two, three, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so let's have a listen. So this is one, two, three. This is from one more from the 2018 Yas Band release by my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky. If I have it right, it features Patrick Sheng, uh, David Jarvis, Brian Ward, and you on the solos, right? Right, I'm playing alto and my nephew is playing tenor. And that is right, it's Brian playing piano. All right, here we go.
one, two, three, one selection from the album Yas yes Band on 2018 release. And we're going to move on to the 2021 release of that group where we just heard that half was recorded in the studio and then, you know, we had to find other solutions to finish it up. And this one is called Blues for Brecker. And of course, you know, meaning Michael Brecker. I hear a lot of skunky grooves and I hear some reharmonized blues. Tell us about your relationship here with, with Michael Brecker and how you built that into this piece. Michael Brecker, I think, influenced certainly all the saxophonists of my time. Really, everybody going forward, even my younger students, some of whom are not as familiar with him, they all know him. They know his records and all that stuff. He's so interesting in the way that he can combine a lot of these Coltrane ideas and a lot of what the New York saxophonists were doing at that time, like Dave Liebman and uh, Steve Grossman and people like that. So he used that kind of stuff and combined it with a kind of almost like funky kind of soul-oriented saxophone playing almost, you know, combined that stuff together. And that really just kind of affected everybody. The other thing about him is that he could really do things that nobody else could do. There are a number of really great saxophone players. And then there's a handful that have that kind of command and technique. You know, I mean, you would just listen to something and go, my God, how does he do that? How can anybody do that? He was very inspirational to me. I got to meet him once. I didn't get to know him well, but he came out to the Northwest and I made it a point, obviously, to go see him. I saw him a number of times, actually, but I got to go backstage and meet with him and stuff. And he was such a nice guy. And, you know, and everybody says that about him. He was such a down-to-earth, really regular person for being such a phenomenal saxophone player. So at one point there was a contest to arrange something by Michael Brecker or to, I guess, write something inspired by him. And I came up with this tune, but I set it aside. I didn't finish it, you know, and it kind of sat around for a while. I didn't have the right ensemble to play it. I didn't think of the right instrumentation. It just didn't seem like the right time to do it. And then Michael passed away tragically. I mean, he should still be with us, of course. And then this project came along and I thought, maybe this is time to go revisit that. So I'm not going to say that I was very influenced by him, by his playing, his ideas. And like I said, I think every saxophone player, I didn't really try and write something that is like Michael Brecker. You know what I mean? I wanted to just write, was just sort of a tribute. And I wanted something on the record that was funky. The drummer is good at that. There's an excellent guitar player, Gabe Condon, who's just a young guy who plays on this. I need to find something kind of special for him to play. The trumpet player is Vern Seelert, who is a fantastic trumpet player who lives on only eight miles from me and teaches at the University of Idaho because Washington State University and the University of Idaho were right next to each other. And so I'm lucky. I've been playing in a jazz quintet with him for a long time, close to 20 years, I think. I always am happy to play with him. But I wanted to do something a little different here. So I used the soprano saxophone lead, which of course Thad Jones kind of pioneered and used so much in his big band. And I thought it just sounded so great. I thought that might give a different feeling to this. So I'm playing soprano saxophone on this. And you you would think on a funky tune like this would be tenor saxophone solo but I thought I'll just play a soprano saxophone solo and see how it goes it's a drum feature too from my friend Dave Jarvis there's a lot of kind of drum breaks in there Dave joined the faculty I think in 1987 I joined in 82 we've been friends ever since he retired from the university just a couple of years ago but it's it's always a pleasure to work with him for sure groovy <laughs> and it's such a wonderful tribute to the mastery of Michael Brecker you know as you said it's it's crazy that only after decade or not even of his passing you know that the memory starts to fade and how quickly that often goes so it's important that we keep our masters in mind and, and, and pass that on was this one that you recorded in the studio together before your split or after yeah I love the fact that you asked that this is recorded with everybody separately although I will say we did have bass and drums and I think the piano on this too bass drums and piano recorded together and a few people came in the studio one at a time to play and a lot of people send in their parts from home and I recorded all my parts at home. The groove is together and in the pocket so that worked out. So here's Blues for Brecker. This is from the 2021 release called New Normal, the Yas Band and this is actually on Origin Records. Here we go. <laughs>
for Brecker, a selection from the new normal release of the Yas Band by my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky. This is a brand new recording and we have time to talk about one more and listen to one more piece from this recording. And this is going to be the title track, New Normal. What do you think? What is our new normal? <laughs> what are we moving into? It's a huge question because we're not really out of it yet, right? This way of making recordings, some people would say is not as good. It's here to stay though. People are going to be doing more of this kind of thing. I know that my friends in Los Angeles, trombone player who's playing a solo on this is Francisco Torres, who plays all the Disney stuff and with Pancho Sanchez, plays in Gordon Goodwin's band, the regular LA studio guy and great jazz player. Those folks that television productions and movie productions they were all done but the music wasn't done and then COVID hit so how were they going to record they couldn't go into a studio together the people who could record at home were working and the people who could who could not record at home they were not working so this is a skill that everybody needs to have now you learn more by making mistakes and then recovering quickly than if everything is smooth sailing so one thing we got out of this is a steep, steep learning curve and, and adaption of, of new things that I think the time was about right anyway to, to go. Well, then. whether it was right or not, it was just like the world said, it's now, you got to do it. And you are such a brilliant, creative person. You just jumped in and learned this new stuff. Some people I know who just were, well, I'm just not going to do that. I can't blame them in a way. But yeah, I learned a tremendous amount about recording and video production. I didn't know any of that stuff. But here I am mixing and mastering the recordings that my big band made with, you know, tracks that they made playing went into their iPhone. And they shot video of themselves with smartphones and sent me that and I assembled those. I'm glad I learned it. And I think it is a skill that younger musicians are just gonna, it's just gonna be part of what they do. You know, it was really fun to get to chat and, and get to listen to your music and introduce that. And I think that'll be the perfect way to go out to listen to the new normal. That's my friend Willis Deloney playing the piano solo and right. Francisco Torres is the trombone solo. Well, thank you, Greg, for spending the time with me and, and sharing about your music. A real treat. Thank you, Monica. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So here it is, The New Normal from the release The New Normal by the Yas Band, a 2021 origin release by my guest today, Greg Yasinitsky. Enjoy. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to Talking Jazz today. My guest was composer, educator, saxophonist Greg Yasinitsky. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana, or online at wetfthejazzstation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.